Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Andreas, for the nice introduction. Uh, thanks to all of you for attending this uh, very early morning session. Uh, also in consideration of the great variety of ales that this city offers. It's really appreciated. Um, yeah. Yesterday have been said already, flowers are nice, but I don't really see my slides. Um, so what we do at uh, uh, the Institute for Information Law uh, that is so re relevant for our project. In the first uh, uh, presentation, Niels very effectively uh, identified what uh, the problems are in connection with uh, uh, the use and reuse, especially of data. Um, I have, under this point of view, a uh, much uh, nicer task, the one to tell you that uh, there is still hope. Uh, we can uh, overcome many of the legal uh, hurdles that uh, um, copyright and especially the sui generis right in the case of databases uh, imposes on the use and reuse of data. So we have seen uh, that uh, we have a variety of IP rights that could uh, uh, impede us as researchers or as practitioners uh, to use the uh, information that is available. Um, this grid variety, as said, uh, can be based uh, on many different IP rights. We are focusing mostly on, on, uh, on two of them, uh, copyright, and even more on uh, the sui generis right, as said. Uh, we have a problem. Can we know beforehand if we can reuse those data? Because that's the point, right? I mean, we, we, as Andreas introduced uh, at the beginning, uh, what uh, would be nice is to achieve a structure where we know beforehand, not a structure where uh, the technical part does the job and then the lawyers arrive and says, sorry, you can't do that yet. You just, you know, wasted the last uh, six months. And that's not because we're bad. That's, you know, the laws that uh, willing or not uh, uh, give conditions to our use of data. Um, Niels clarified how speculative can be in certain situation to establish beforehand whether a given type of use of data is allowed or not, since uh, the exceptions and limitation to the sui generis right are very narrow. Uh, if we take the directive, uh, we can see that uh, there are only just a handful of them, and none of, it, uh, none of them is actually mandatory. So it's up to the national states to decide whether to implement them, and if yes, to which extent. And we have seen a couple of examples of how Germany and the UK implement uh, those, those type of exceptions. We see that they are very narrow and hardly they can offer as a framework uh, that allows uh, uh, reuse without any type of concerns. Um, is there a solution? Yes. Uh, it's not uh, the solution to all of our problems. It's not uh, the ultimate uh, great uh, definitive one but it's something that probably um, allows us to do the job. Uh, they are called licenses, which are, we can define for uh, our purposes as authorizations, usually in the form of contractual agreements that the right holder gives uh, to uh, a specific or uh, an indeterminate amount of people to do certain activities with protected uh, material. Um, of course, it would be much easier if the exceptions that were mentioned were, for example, mandatory in the whole European Union and were uh, much more harmonized or even better uh, uniformized in a way that uh, there wouldn't be different treatment uh, depending on the European country where we are. But this is another story. It's very long. There are a lot of effort to moving into this direction, but there are also a lot of... Uh, um, um, hurdles to get there because, of course, the interests at stake are many. So let's remain uh, on uh, the topic of uh, that uh, we, we believe can offer us a good solution for the time being. Again, licenses. Uh, why they are so good? Well, basically because uh, uh, they allow us to do what we want. Uh, probably most of you are familiar with the usual licenses employed. In, uh, in software development called free libre open source software. So if you use any uh, Linux based uh, solution, uh, Apache based uh, uh, web servers, 
or any other development tool that usually is identified with free, with being free or open source software. Uh, you're using 80% of the cases a license called general public license developed by the GNU project. This license allows you to reuse the software, to modify it, and to redistribute it. Uh, that's why, differently from other development tools, you don't have uh, um, to acquire uh, licenses, paying royalties for them. Uh, so thanks to a license. So the licenses can allow us to do basically what we want. Uh, the legal system grants to the right holder a very uh, strong amount and numerous amount of rights. And building on that, the license says, well, since you have all these rights, you are also in the position to license them, to grant people the authorization, the permission to use and reuse uh, your software, your data, your literature under the following conditions. That's the pros, what's the cons? Well, do we know what we want? Not always, it's very hard. Um, there are technical uh, and also legal uh, problems connected with that. Um, as in any technical field, what uh, uh, um, a person that develops this software or uh, application or um, database infrastructure know about his needs and how to translate these needs into legal terms. So taking care of a whole bunch of different rules that might apply or not is a completely different uh, uh, type of analysis. That's why uh, very uh, successful are a type of licenses called standard form contract or standard form licenses. So licenses that are basically prepacked, they are prepared. You don't have to write yourself your own agreement, but you can use uh, somebody else's licenses that are already uh, prepared. Um, they should be written down in very uh, sound and robust uh, manner uh, under, of course, a legal point of view. Um, you don't have to uh, waste uh, your time in negotiating these licenses. Um, Often, especially among departments, uh, you have to negotiate the conditions at which a uh, given software or a given cell line or some biological material can be sent to another laboratory for what type of uses. Uh, this type of transaction costs sometimes are, are in terms of uh, uh, negotiations, in terms of money, are very high. Uh, they can take up a month before the agreement is achieved. And this, of, co sorry, of course, again, stop uh, um, innovation research because it requires time and, and money and uh, legal competences. Um, so standard form contracts uh, are a solution to that. Um, again, the GPL, uh, Creative Commons licenses, um, Open Database license, all these licenses that you can identify by name, they are standard form licenses. They are some sort of de facto standard that people use. Uh, there is some trust created around them by the use of, uh, of, uh, of basically all of us. Uh, and uh, um, they offer different type of advantages, um, especially two that I have identified in the second point are enforceability. They are framed in a way that uh, given any legal system, they have a, vi a very high degree of enforceability, meaning they work in this legal system. Um, in open air, we are, I'm not sure exactly how many countries, but I would say around 30, uh, with 30 different legal systems. Are we sure that uh, a specific data released with one specific license operates in, Germ in Germany as well as operates in uh, um, Sweden or France or Portugal? That's another issue that we have to consider. Uh, but thanks to uh, this type of licenses, this aspect is also uh, uh, addressed. And also, of course, compatibility. If you combine different type of data, another thing that you want to achieve is compatib compatibility about the uh, between the licenses. Um, the examples that I'm bringing here is, uh, uh, two, well, three types, but we will see them of Creative Commons licenses. Um, the way the, the reason why I'm using them as an example is mainly because uh, the fact that they are very widely uh, uh, used. There are of course others that for mainly time uh, 
uh, uh, reasons. We cannot address it here, but they are part of our legal analysis. Um, Creative Commons especially have, a, 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 the, the, in my opinion, this type of, of advantages over other type of licenses. On well, the first place, of course, they are standard form contracts. Um, they are created through an open and participative process. So if you participate to, per, for example, uh, the mailing list or the uh, legal task forces, you can actually contribute to develop uh, uh, the legal structure of the license in a way that is very similar to how free software is developed. Uh, the idea behind it is that, of course, um, the more people working be, uh, on that document uh, make it possible to uh, identify uh, every possible legal bug and fix it. Um, they are also customizable uh, to some extent. So using uh, Creative Commons, you can decide whether or not to, uh, for example, use, uh, uh, well, attribution is given in any case, uh, but share alike. So if uh, you allow the use of your data, in this case, uh, the condition that uh, uh, the reuse needs to be uh, distributed under the same terms. So similar to what the concept of copyleft would be in the field of software. Uh, you can use non-derivative condition or non-commercial. And you can choose to insert or not these clauses. Um, and they are expressed in three languages. It's debatable whether this is an uh, uh, advantage or not. But they are expressed in legal terms. Uh, so they're real document in human terms. Um, I don't really agree with this terminology because it suggests that uh, we lawyers are not humans and I can grant you that we are. Um, but the human language would uh, represent a very short uh, um, summary of what you're allowed to do and what you're not. And then another one that is usually called uh, uh, the machine language, which is basically uh, metadata information attached to the uh, work that determines how uh, this uh, um, data set or any other work is to be uh, distributed under like the license point of view. Um, I'm almost uh, uh, about to conclude. Uh, the three licenses that I want to point out just briefly are the Creative Commons public license um, where we can attach or not the conditions that we have seen before, so attribution, share alike, non-derivative, non-commercial. The version 3, which is the one currently in use. Version 4, which is the one that should be uh, released very soon. And the CC0. And show you how these licenses uh, deal with the sui generis right. Uh, basically, the CC 3.0 in the unported version, meaning the international one, says nothing about the sui generis right which means that in this case, this right is still reserved to the right holder. What does it mean? It means that even if you have a repository of, a license, of a works or of data released under a Creative Commons 3.0 unported license, this does not mean that you can, for example, data mine that repository because the sui generis right has not been licensed. In uh, the 4.0, to overcome this problem, uh, the sui generis right uh, that we have identified in the, in the previous pre presentation is included in the scope of the license, meaning that uh, um, if you choose to employ uh, a condition like pure attribution, which is the most liberal, also the sui generis right is uh, licensed under this pure attribution condition. If you choose share alike, also the sui generis right, right is uh, released under this condition, the fact that uh, it needs to be share alike. So if you redistribute it under the same terms uh, of the original license. And finally, the CC0, uh, which uh, is a general waiver of all the possible rights that attach to uh, a, a work or a data set. In this case, you basically waive the right holder uh, this is another issue that uh, we cannot address today, but it's another important aspect. You need to be the right holder, which usually doesn't correspond or not necessarily with the author. But anyway, the right holder waives every possible right. Uh, and in this case, we would have a situation that in the field uh, of software is mostly more similar to what a BSD license would allow you. So free reuse under almost no condition. 
Um, I have a couple of more slides uh, just outlining the specific uh, wording of these uh, different licenses. Um, I don't think we have to go uh, that much into detail, but of course license, uh, the slides are available, so you can take uh, a better look at them and see how specific words, uh, wording changes uh, and how this reflects the, it reflects into the licensing or not of uh, the sui generis right. And of course, if you have any type of uh, question, request, etc., you can uh, ask your legal partners. Uh, as I say, as Andreas introduced at the beginning, um, believe it or not, uh, uh, at least our commitment in this specific project is real research. And uh, this means that we have to implement our results, our structure within the project. Because this is the only way to create a workflow that reduces to a minimum the risk connected with copyright or sui generis right infringement. If we create a structure and after that we figure out that, oh, well, you sh we should have paid more attention to this issue, that creates a lot of uh, overhead, a lot of cost, a lot of implementation of solution that could have been implemented since the very beginning. So write us emails, uh, uh, offer us a beer and talk, uh, and we uh, will try to address all, hopefully, all or some of the issues connected. Um, been a bit long, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.